been a bit of a a ball egg, right? So much so that I happened to stumble upon this uh, really interesting podcast. I say really interesting, but you know, um, I don't know. It's it's a podcast that really kind of threw me back a little bit. I was a bit surprised by the take some of the hosts had on it. And this podcast is the one Recode Decode with uh, Kara Swisher. Now, I have to preface this by saying that I've never been the biggest Kara Swisher fan. There's something about her tone and the way she goes about interviewing people that kind of rubs me up the wrong way. She had an interview with uh, Elon Musk a while back. A while back, I think maybe when he was doing the boring project or something. I forgot what it was, but she had one of the interviews on stage with Elon Musk. Oh no, I think maybe it was during the whole like um, Tesla stuff, right? When he was uh, sleeping at the office or whatever. And she just came across really snarky, really condescending. And she just came across as somebody who has a really high opinion of herself, even though by, you know, on paper, she's just a journalist, right? She's, don't get me wrong, she's an influential journalist. She's been around since the advent of startups and Silicon Valley. She's very well respected in that industry. People want, people go to her in order to kind of get their story straight. She's very respected. I'm like Malaki, but I just find the way she goes about stuff really annoying. The fact that she wears those stupid aviator glasses, like she's terminated or something of interviews is drives me off the wall as well. Just tiny things about her are just kind of a little bit rubbing up the wrong way. But again, regardless of that, she does, she does great interviews for the most part. But she, um, they put out a recent podcast. Um, I'm not sure if she's part of Rico, she's founded Rico, but whatever it is, uh, Rico Deco that she does. Um, there's different podcasts that they host on that platform, and she has one. And um, this latest one kind of uh, obviously, um, I wouldn't say triggered me, but got me thinking about how people look at things differently than how I look at things. It's just the different, you know, different perspectives we have on things in general as human beings, and whether or not it's intrinsic or something that we learn over time. So the podcast is called Why Silicon Valley Loves biohacking and intermittent fasting right hosted on rico deco it's up here on the screen for you guys to see but i'll link in the show notes for you guys listening via the audio podcast for you guys to check out yourself i really can listen to the whole podcast but really interesting so i'll read the description for you here and it will give you uh, a little aspect of it right uh so this is here um the description of the podcast episode is as follows um inspired by the trendiness of intermittent fasting in the tech community kyle social executive producer uh, erica anderson talks with free eating habit experts a biohacker an academic and an eating disorder specialist in this episode um hvm ceo jeff Wu on the culture body of optimization the mainstreaming of biohacking and how humans are approaching god aging nutrition expert dr walter longo who's you know if, if you guys that are aware of um, intermittent fasting and you're aware of uh, Dr. Sachin Panda, and you're aware of, uh, oh, what's her name now? She comes on Joe Rogan all the time. I keep, why did I forget her name now? Doesn't matter, but you will, you will know who Walter Longo is. He was a fucking legend in the biohacking, I mean, the intermittent fasting field. Um, on the origins of biohacking, the science behind intermittent fasting, and the problem with Silicon Valley's interpretation of the practice, and the executive director of the National Eating Disorder, um, Claire Misko, on the line uh, between eccentric diets and disorders, the wellness industry, and what to do if someone you know needs help. Follow Kara Sutcher at da 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 da. Anyway, so essentially, it, the whole premise of this whole podcast came from um, a couple of these people. I think Erica Anderson, the uh, producer of uh, Rico Decode, and Kara Sutcher had both been a bit alarmed by Jack Dorsey's appearance as of late, right? Jack Dorsey is the CEO of uh, Twitter, right? So I think they had seen him at a show or a conference or something, and they were kind of taken aback by how gaunt, how skinny, and how quote-unquote unhealthy he looked according to these two women. And of course, when they kind of delved into it a little bit deeper, they found an article about um, Jack Dorsey that kind of um, spoke about his kind of day and how he kind of goes about it. You know, it's a general kind of thing they ask him, they ask most startup founders how you kind of get so much out of the day because usually these founders are operating at a really high level and they try to understand how they go about kind of, you know, um, constructing the day and getting the most out of it productivity wise. So because of that, they kind of stumble upon the fact that he eats and fasts and doesn't, I think he, he eats one meal a day, which is dinner. And he doesn't eat on the weekends. And it kind of uh, surmised that that was kind of leading to his image and why he looks the way he does. And also hypothesized that basically um, intermittent fasting has turned into some kind of cover for um, eating disorders. It's just a weird way. Anyway, they do preface it by saying that they're a bit hesitant to, to kind of talk about people's appearance. But, you know, again, they're doing it, right? It's like that kind of quintessential thing that someone did to me the other day when I was DJing. Some dude comes up to me and says, oh, yeah, I'm a DJ too, man. And I really hate when people ask me to play a song, but can you play? It's like, if you really ask people, if you really ask it, if you really hate it when people do it to you, why are you doing it to me? And you did it anyway, 
right? It's just like a, it's one of those weird things that people say that, you know, it just, it's kind of a, a pleasantry you kind of throw out. So the fact that they said, oh, we don't want to talk about Jack Dorsey's appearance because, you know, that's not what we're about. And, you know, it's about accepting people for their, what they are and, you know, but self love. They still decided to kind of essentially framework this entire podcast around uh, Jack Dorsey's supposed eating disorder because he tends to not eat five meals a day and they don't consist of pasta rice and bread and all that malarkey so it's a really interesting really interesting podcast but again something that really got me thinking so i made some notes regarding some topics i want to talk about and then we can kind of kind of carry on from there um so yeah was i, I talked about the adulation the most interview that comes across uh, uh, Jack Dorsey looks gone. yes 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 they say she so um this is something that kind of got me thinking about the whole idea, right? In the podcast episode, they say the following, right? Um, say he looks like they say he looks gaunt and skinny and unhealthy, which you know he probably could do, right? If you're gonna eat one meal a day and you're gonna not eat on the weekends, and you know, and you're running, no, let's say you're gonna eat one meal a day and you're not gonna eat on the weekends, you're gonna look a certain way. That's just the standard, you know. We have to kind of surmise that, especially if you're the one meal a day you're eating is very nutrition nutritionally rich, right? You're gonna drop some pounds. Your skin's going to tighten up a little bit. You're going to look different. It's just a standard way of it, right? Even with keto diet now, I can, you know, my my, my mouth feels weird since I've not had any kind of sugars, whatever, and I've kind of eliminated carbohydrates and I've been fasting since essentially 2 p.m. My mouth feels a bit gammy. You're going to feel different. You're going to look different. That's the way it should be. But the weird thing about this whole conversation, I thought, was that they never once in the whole conversation spoke about what Jack Dorsey does does as a, what's his actual job, right? And his job is to be the leader of Twitter and Stripe. No, uh, Stripe? No, Stripe. Um, Square? Uh, Square? Or Square? What's that, what's that um, company Jack Dorsey's got? Is it Square Cash? Square Cash? Jack Dorsey company. Is Square Cash? Or am I going crazy? I'm pretty sure it's Square Cash, right? Twitter and Square. That's it. Cool. So he's a he's a he's a he's the head um, he's the CEO of both Twitter and Square, right? And I don't need to tell you guys anything about you know both companies, but they're pretty huge in the landscape of digital, in the landscape of the internet, right? They're huge as fuck. Um, Twitter even more so because nowadays, especially in the current social political climate that we're in, Twitter's become like you know has kind of gone through so many resurgences over the years that you know I don't know if it's in its fourth, sixth, seventh wave of resurgence but twitter's a big fucking deal right so this guy is at the helm of two companies that are like you know pioneering things in their own industry whether it's in digital economy in terms of money whether it's in social media social justice in terms of twitter he's at the helm of both those companies and if you read any book about ceos about founders most of their time isn't spent of isn't spent on kind of directing the overall planning of the company and how it's going to go and do designing cool features and lending a hand on that. Most of his time is going to be spent putting out fires, right? Uh, making sure the company doesn't burn to the ground. That's essentially his job 24 seven, two, uh, seven days of the week. He's probably, even when he's meditating and he's on those silent retreats, there's probably a fail safe that he's kind of designed or he's kind of, um, engineered or he's kind of put in place with some of the people that work at twitter where if something if xyz was to happen they have a button they can press that he could just immediately fly out from wherever he is and go straight back to the whole twitter hq in in silicon valley so he's doing all these things and i'm sure in the in the process of you know going through his um deciding on how to best run these companies He's decided to adopt meditation. He's had a different kind of diet. He kind of um, has been very forthright in terms of fronting any issue and going on stuff like Joe Rogan podcasts and other podcasts he's appeared on and giving interviews and really being upfront and trying to say he's doing better and getting people in place to kind of make some changes. He's kind of really, really trying to, he's not burying his head in the sand. That's what I'm trying to say. And the kind of process of trying to figure out how to best optimize his level of performance, because again, he's leading Twitter and Square. He's not working a nine to five somewhere in a regular job in the middle of Liverpool Street. He's leading two of the most biggest influential companies in the world, right? He decided to maybe um, do away with uh, focusing on where to get his breakfast or where to get his lunch and kind of concentrate on the one meal a day that he thinks gets the most, uh, brings in the most value and the most satisfaction. And I won't be surprised if somehow, you know, he's on call from let's say six or five in the morning until whenever he leaves work. So that dinner is sort of like a way for him to kind of mentally check out, right? Like I'm eating my lunch and I'm off for work. It's like essentially like what I'm doing now at my new, at my new job or what some people do at their, new, at their jobs in general. 
where you kind of leave your computer at work. You don't take your laptop back home, right? The idea behind that is that you've kind of done, right? You close the laptop and you just go back home. That's me finished for the day. I'm over. I'm not going to think about work anymore. I just come in and whatever, whatever happens, happens between now and the, and the next day. But I'll do it when I come in the morning. So maybe that whole dinner thing is a way for him to kind of mentally uh, check in that he's kind of, you know, he's arrived home now. Like, that's it. It's over. And I'm sure he probably sits around the table with his wife or his family or whatever and kind of breaks bread and doesn't talk anything else about work anymore. So they've somehow surmised that that aspect, that kind of way of doing things has him looking gaunt and it might be an eating disorder, which is, again, it's really, really, really um, inconsiderate. And again, just it kind of strikes me as um, it kind of strikes me as people from the sidelines seeing how the higher echelons of business people let's say in that regard are operating and you know again there might be some jealousy involved in i don't know what it is but it's very interesting to observe just how forthright and how sure people are watching from the sidelines are that how people up at top doing you know the thing that you wish you could do should do the thing that you wish they could do if you get what i mean yeah it's, do you know what i'm saying like i never understood how you can be so sure that you know how jack dorsey should go about conducting his day-to-day uh you know eating habits like how would you know like have you ever had the day in work when you're so busy you forget to go on lunch on the time that you're meant to go on lunch you still go but you forget to go on the time that you wanted to go right let's say you're running twitter then how about that you're running twitter nowadays with trump around with brexit with the stuff that's going on in europe um with the uh, gun violence in the u.s with the civil unrest in central and south america with the our people in the African econ- uh, economy, with the protests in Southeast Asia and China. Like, imagine what you'd be like if you were running that company and you were trying to make sure the house didn't burn down, that you didn't get sued for a bajillion dollars, or whatever it may be. Come on, man. There's so many things going on behind the back. And the last thing I'd be worrying about is food, but he's found a way that kind of works for him at the most part. But they, but again, the, the hosts on Rico Decode think they know completely what he should be doing. It's, it's, it's just bizarre. Um, And I read here, uh, and this is a kind of interesting um, quote here. I I think they mentioned this on here. They mentioned that they say that he's broadcasting the message um, about his diet. And again, I don't think he's broadcasting. I'm pretty sure they went out and saw, again, the the host of Rico Decode saw him on stage, thought he looked unhealthy, then went and kind of dug in a bit deeper, found out, found he's kind of eating, you know, his daily plan or a weekly plan that he does. And then surmised from there, his eating habits, right? And figured out, oh, he's doing intermittent fasting. That's probably why he looks the way he does intermittent fasting equals um, eating disorder. Now, the issue that I have with that is that I think nowadays, anyway, especially in society, we have a, this. there's this weird idea. I think it's less more, it's more so with entertainment and now i guess celebrity culture has kind of you know spread into entrepreneurship uh with you know how many people that you know you follow on social media have you know entrepreneur in their kind of bio and they don't make they don't make or sell anything right um which is kind of bizarre in that regard uh whatever yeah but everyone kind of has kind of wants to adopt that kind of moniker on their name but it's interesting that with intro with entrepreneurship specifically people don't treat entrepreneurship the same way they treat athletics or sports right which they should so when someone reads an article of mark zuckerberg or of elon musk or of travis kokanis formerly of uber i don't know why they think if they follow the way they do things that somehow they will also launch an uber that's not the way things go right it's like if you read if you if i somehow um found out what lebron's training regiment was there's no way I'm going to end up looking like LeBron James. There's no way I'm going to end up playing basketball like LeBron James. Same way if I found out what uh, Christian Ronaldo did in terms of his acceleration or the way he plays football. I'm never going to be that level of player that he is. I might re- reach a certain level. I might get really high. I might get really close. But I'm not going to do anything similar to what he does, the way he does it, right? It's just one of those kind of things. You have to, you have to be aware that outliers and talented people do exist. And if those outliers telling people apply themselves and have a good work ethic, there's no way you're going to ever catch them, right? There's no way you're ever going to be able to replicate their results. So I think the same should be, the same sort of mindset should be adopted when you look at people in business, right? Those people that I mentioned, the Jeff Bezos, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Travis Kokanises, the Jack Dorseys, these are outliers, right? Matt Mullowicks, these are people that are just like, you know, that are pushing the envelope. Elon Musk, they are the ones that are kind of, quote unquote advancing humankind right trying to push us to the next frontier um why would you 
why would you surmise or why would you hypothesize that they would go about their day-to-day life the way that me and you do right have you heard the phrase um uh in order to achieve an extraordinary result you have to be willing to do extraordinary things right if you if you want to do extraordinary things you have to do if you want to if you want to have extraordinary results you have to do extraordinary things just one of those kind of i don't see why that's so crazy so i'm not i would be surprised if jack Dorsey said he just eats hamburgers and drinks coca-cola right that's the, in the same way that we were surprised when we heard donald trump say that right because it doesn't it's not befitting of somebody that's trying to lead a nation that he's going to be you know eating cheeseburgers and drinking coca-cola right and not exercising it doesn't really make any sense so why would you think that somebody who would uh, someone like a jack dorsey yeah with maybe a computer science background maybe an engineering background would try and engineer a solution that works best to try and eke out the most um uh, value from his kind of day-to-day life like why would this be surprising and why would you or why would i as a normal person as a layman think that if i copied what he does that i'm also going to launch an app like that it just doesn't make any sense but again i guess it kind of buys into this whole thing that you know the issue that i have with startups in general especially ones in london that you know i run like shit mostly everyone's trying to copy whoever is in front of them right and trying to kind of you know replicate that result or is or if they're lucky uh be able to kind of you know ipo or get absorbed by a big company cash out and go you know sip a mai tai somewhere on the beach but for the most part I just I don't know I, I was surprised that they thought he was broadcasting it and and I was surprised that they surmised that people are going to be influenced by that and start having you know it's like what makes no sense and then uh, another bit I really thought I was um uh, that was interesting was this bit here at the bottom which says we need to define what health is and I guess this is the overall point of it to kind of end this I'm rambling on a bit too much about it but the overall end feeling I got from this was that essentially what this whole debate around jack dorsey's eating habits has kind of centered around is um what i've kind of seen a little bit happen in the whole fat acceptance movement um which i have no problem with being a former fatty myself i know how difficult it can be to navigate around the world uh being a bigger person right um the world isn't really set up to accommodate you in that regard especially a place like london um it's very small it's very old um, it's very Victorian in that regard. The streets are small and we're getting bigger and bigger, you know, as generations progress and as the food gets better, as we try to eat out more nutrients, we're beginning, becoming larger and larger and larger. And we don't really have a um, uh, an environment that kind of, kind of accommodate for all our, you know, heights, breaths and weights, whatever it may be, right? But there is another part of the fact that Texas movement, which I'm not really down for, where they're trying to redefine what health is, right? In order to fit their own narrative and you see that a lot now where it's like oh just because you're skinny doesn't mean you're healthy just because you're fat doesn't mean i'm not healthy which you know is right they both can be right but you can't tell me that being obese is optimal for your way of, is optimal for your life in general you can't tell me that that is true and you can't tell me that you don't suffer from any um, ill effects of health from you know essentially allowing yourself to eat unhinged or allowing yourself to do whatever you want with your body there has to be some level of care you take with yourself. It's not to do with anyone else, just just for yourself. You just take some care in maintaining or in making sure you're at an, a level of health that's allowing you to just be of use or be of value to the people around you, right? That's just, I don't know, well, well, it's not even something to do with anyone else, but to do you and your family and friends. But I think this whole idea um, that we have to redefine health has come around the whole fact, fact, fact acceptance movement and has now spread into wellness. And um, a lot of it has kind of, a lot of it comes from a good place, I think, because in general, the whole wellness industry is maybe geared more towards women. And I guess women in general do have a lot more anxiety, and a lot more trepidation, a lot more worry when it comes to their kind of self-image, because a lot of their worth is basically centered around that, whether it's from the patriarchy, whether it's from conditioning from their parents. I've mentioned that story time and time again of that Brazilian friend that I had who essentially was starving herself when she came to London because she was afraid that when she goes back home to Brazil, the first thing people are going to say is that how much weight she's gained, right? One of the kind of um, beauties, one of the kind of uh, uh, things that they look forward to as young girls in Brazil is that if they work out and they work, had a great summer, when they go around to their you know, relative's house, the first thing they're going to say is, oh, how skinny, how amazing they look, right? So the opposite is true if you decide to put in a couple of LBs and you're going to trip a holiday. I was like, but I was stunned by that, right? So there's those are reasons why women are a little bit uh neurotic when it comes to weight but i'm also not a fan of this whole idea that wellness is now somehow a dirty word right looking after yourself has now turned into uh this idea that uh wellness has become like it's been painted as like a white uh predominantly white 
patriarchal influenced uh, thing now that it's essentially uh, promoting fad diets, which is bizarre in that regard, because I thought self care Sundays was like a thing that people kind of were adopting in order to kind of, you know, take care of themselves and, you know, sort of being glued to their phones and sort of being watching YouTube videos. I don't know, meditate, put some cucumbers in their eyes, put a bit of a face mask on, light some candles, and just kind of like take it easy before they start the working week again. But now that's got a dirty name. So I think in general, there is just, there's just too many people that are worried about the wrong things. I think, you know, again, if you're happy the way you are, then cool. But I also think you should be, you shouldn't try and tell other people how they should act or you shouldn't tell other people who are trying to do crazy things that they shouldn't do crazy. They shouldn't do the crazy things in order to kind of get to that crazy thing they want to get to. I think people should just be left their own devices again, which is not, you know, in the society we live in now, that's not the thing that we want to do. You know, they want to kind of stifle the weirdos. But for the most part, our eccentric folks and our weirdos have to be left unhinged to do weird sh- shit. That's just how it should go, right? And us people who are, you know, the regular, regular five meals a day, um, you know, eating the same bread and pasta every lunchtime and, you know, drinking and doing drugs, whatever it may be, you should be left to do what you want to do too. No one's uh, saying you shouldn't, but you shouldn't uh, live, you shouldn't tell other people how to live their life according to yours, make you feel more comfortable. That's essentially what I'm trying to get at, um, which probably won't happen because I think nowadays, I think, you know, to s- the society we have now, people are just, you know, especially with social media and stuff, like we live in an age where the whole nature of being alive now is to lend comments to what other people are doing, right? Essentially kind of what I'm doing now on the podcast, talk about what people are doing in order to kind of make yourself feel better, which I'm not really doing anyway. I'm talking about things I'm interested in, but yeah, I just find it bizarre. So I really recommend you check it out if you're that way inclined. Um, recode, decode. It's podcast. I don't know what episode it is, but um, you check it out. I don't think they number them. It's called uh, "Why Silicon Valley Loves Black Biohacking and Internet of Fasting." Really interesting. Again, I don't agree with any of the points said. I think they are kind of trying to, uh, you know, trying to, you know, apply normal people rules or normal people ways of living to people that are doing extraordinary things, which doesn't make sense in the slightest. Could Jack Dorsey do with a good night's sleep? Maybe. Could he do with a shave? Maybe. Could he do blah blah blah? Could he do? Could he? Could he? Yes. But am I running a you know a billion dollar company, two billion dollar companies, whatever it may be called, and one that's at the forefront of you know social political issues and has been blamed for essentially hiring Trump? Am I am I doing that? No. So if he's doing that and he also thinks this is the best way to go about life, then you know we have to just trust him and hope that he gets better soon, or you know even better, we hope that he gets in a better place. So he's able to look after himself to our conventional needs sooner rather than later. But I don't know. But yeah, it's an interesting podcast. I recommend you check it out regardless if you're that way inclined. And then we move on.